Hello, Jeff. Brian, how's it going? Fantastic. Question for you, more general question as the tour director. Every time we have a T-pad debacle on the tour, especially when it's caught on camera and you hear people talking about it throughout the week, the concept of T-pad regulation comes up. Mm -hmm. And you being the tour director has to be the guy that deals with all of these comments about the T-pads mm -hmm. that the players are playing on. My first part of this question that you can answer is, what does the, the, the term T-pad regulation actually mean to you? Is it a buzzword that doesn't have much substance, or is there something tangible that you can go off of with that? A little bit of both, I would say. So um, any T-pad surface that you decide to use, and we allow three turf, concrete pavers, or, or concrete pours, um, can be good or bad depending on installation and maintenance. So when you say I'm gonna standardize a type of surface, um, that doesn't really mean anything, right? Um, it, it, what matters is how it was installed, how it was maintained, how it was prepared for competition. It, in that, the tour is making great strides to get people there two weeks in advance. We have people two weeks in advance um, at every event and a bigger and bigger advance team. And I think down the road, um, you know, uh, T-pad preparation and standardization all is going to revolve around just more advanced work, which, you know, we're, we're improving on every year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that when it comes to creating a standard, it's really about how it performs, you know, over anything else. Like, is it flat? You know, is it, uh, does it have the right amount of friction? You know, and, and friction testing is something that we're looking at. Um, but again, you have to be there in advance and you have to test right before the tournament. You have to test it with mud on it. Mm -hmm. You have to test it with like a bunch of play right in a row in various conditions. So it's a really hard, hard thing. And I know that all of our event teams work really hard. Jonesboro just installed brand new turf tees, you know, before the, uh, the event started. Um, and they, they did it uh, fairly well to like few complaints, but it's really about consistency 100% of the time. That's hard to achieve, and it, it totally understand frustration from players in that, you know. Um, and there's plenty of frustration from TDs that work really hard to provide, you know, really expensive, like in, in yeah. uh, TDs that, that take a long time to put in. So, like, it's, it's a tough, tough problem. I think it is a bit of a buzzword, but there's, there's real standardization solutions out there in the future. And then with that, we can jump into a bit more abstract part of this question. You know, if, if there was no barrier to what you could do maybe financially you know what could be done tangibly um well we're always in event partnerships you know with each event team local organizing committee um you know i i, I don't really see it as necessarily you know a financial barrier but you know like i said t-pads take a long time and take expertise um so it is a bit of a resource question, you know, how many people in the world, you know, know how to put in a really great repeatable T-pad. Um, can we ship them off to every region, you know, ahead of time? We have a lot of trust for long running events that have delivered great results over the, over the years. So, um, you know, we try hard not to stick our finger in the middle of everything every event does. You know, we, these are partnerships. Um, however, as you know, the standards keep improving, we're the ones driving them forward. So in a utopia, you know, like it's probably us, you know, installing in partnership with events. Um, the T pads that you know cost, you know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars to like put in excavator work, um, clearing, you know, probably forty by twenty pads that have twenty by ten T pads that have perfect tactile grip. Um, you know, whether they're concrete or turf, different players prefer different things. Also depends on footwear for players. You know, you maybe too grippy for someone and um, perfect for someone and maybe too slippery for someone and perfect for someone else. So footwear is a big, you know, part of this as well. But I would say, yeah, I mean, put a quarter million dollars into every course um, a year in advance and they'll probably set for, you know, a good four years. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> and then last question for me, you know, speaking of partnerships, you know, you do come to these areas and the, and the local community who sets up these events works alongside of you and you kind of inject your branding and everything and your resources mm -hmm. into it. How do you feel being the tour director coming to this, this, uh, this area of the country? Oh, we're always thrilled to come to Emporia. This is Disc Golf USA. And, um, you know, we have a, one of the best event teams in the world led by Jackie and Doug. Um, 
really excited to be working with Jackie for the last few months uh, behind the scenes in preparation. Um, great to have her leadership um, as part of this event. Um, I, they always strive for, you know, doing the next best thing. You know, they just put in a brand new um, huge set of tee pads. You know, they're 15 feet long there, speaking of tee pads, at uh, uh, Joan Supreme. And, um, you know, I, I think that with uh, any event that pushes the limits, there's always so much to do. So we get here, we're busy, we're checking, we're working together. Um, but it always feels good to be back in um, the Disc Golf USA. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Hey, the Disc Golf Guy. Yeah, with the Disc Golf Guy, Smashbox Disc Golf Network. I'm here for them all. <laughs> Ready to ask some questions. Uh, you know, a word that you really just touched on a couple times was partnerships. And one of the other questions and or criticisms that I think came about from last weekend at the Jonesboro event was also with regard to Paul McBath and hitting just below the basket on hole number five. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, what are the conversations like for course assets? Who's helping make those decisions? And do you feel like there's any form of standardization and you know, the pros and the cons to the various options that you guys continue to test? Yeah, we work with our partnerships and operations team. So really our staff and then, you know, one of our key partners is, is Paragon Miles, who produces some of the assets for us. Um, so, you know, we always work to advance and professionalize the course assets. Um, you know, I, I know that we have a version, you know, 2.0 uh, coming of the, you know, basically the, the basket wrap, so to speak. Um, you know, we've got the pull wraps that people have started calling koozies last year. Um, my, uh, <laughs> you're taking credit for that, Terry? Yeah, pull All koozie. Right. I've trademarked it. Okay. I talked to our partner at Sunstein. Well, Don't worry. while we're on this topic, <laughs> I just want to say that I trademark mo mozzarella sticks. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay. But uh, moving forward, uh, yeah, we, we do have version 2.0 coming, um, you know, like the fabrication process, um, testing process is one thing. You know, I, I personally, you know, know that we haven't hit um, the final form of those. And so, you know, we've given feedback. Um, the reality is, is that we do have some partnership sales associated with, you know, those. So we, we test them out. The thing is that we've only done a, a handful of those to see how they worked. When we get to the final form, I expect to see, you know, more and more baskets with, you know, what I would like to think is going to be a very professional solution that's not going to, you know, really have as much impact on competition. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a team internally and, and with our, our good partner and consultant Miles um, that, that works on those. But yeah, we hate to see them uh, maybe affect competition. That said, we always have them installed before official practice days and, and people can judge and react to like, you know, how their disc might play off of them. So um, the competition field is set, um, but yeah, uh, amazing shot by Paul, you know, that is a disappointing reaction off the asset for sure last week. Yeah, and what we could always argue if it would bounced up, hit the actual pole or the basket, it could have had the same reaction, of course, woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? It, it seemed like there was a, a real divide this week as to reactions about we'll say Paul's reactions, not only to that, but then as you walked on the fairway, maybe second guessing the rules and or if there was even a waiver, which a lot of people don't even know exists. So there's a lot of, I feel like it was 50-50. Some people really thought he had a valid leg to stand on and some people thought he came off as a little bit of a complainer. Mm -hmm. So my question to you would be, first of all, what calls can you make on the course? You were near him, he was conversing with you. What calls can you personally be making on the course, and who do those get left up to? Sure. Well, l let me just start by by saying I think Paul is well within, you know, his his rights to ask and question and and make sure that the rules were, um, you know, kind of nipped and tucked there. So you know, I, I didn't see anything but you know fierce competitor, you know, taking. Uh, you know, man, minding his P's and Q's and making sure that everything was in order. So, um, you know, if I was Paul, I would have done the same thing. Um, in terms of, you know, the rules questions, I think this is, a, this is something that a lot of people uh, do have, you know, a murky understanding of or maybe misunderstand. So um, at every event, there is a tournament director. Um, and the rule, the, any rulings, any appeals stop with that tournament director unless they designate a rules director. I'll give an example. Nate Heinold is the tournament director of Ledgestone. He does designate um, uh, Mike Krupica as his rules director. So in that case, the um, the appeals would stop with Mike instead of Nate. Mm. But that's determined beforehand. 
Um, the tournament director also uh, assigns tournament officials. And any of those tournament officials, once they're designated as a tournament official, can make a, any rulings on the course, okay? Um, those rulings, if you look at the PDJ rulebook, actually supersede group rulings. So while there's not an official on, any, on every card and groups are expected to make the calls that they need to make, it's a self-governing sport. When, there's a, when there is a tournament official there, they can make rulings. Um, at Jonesboro, at most events, I am designated as a tournament official. At Jonesboro, I was designated as a tournament official. That means, you know, we have uh, meetings about the rules. We make sure that we review and we try to make consistent calls as a group. But if anybody wanted to appeal one of my rulings as a tournament official, it would go to the tournament director. In this case, um, Brad had designated Matt Lloyd as the rules director. So all the rulings of Jonesboro, all appeals ended with Matt Lloyd, okay? On the question of waivers, um, if any event decides to play uh, OB rules different than it's written in the PDGA rulebook, um, they're supposed to request a waiver from the PDGA. Um, this is because the PDGA may say, hey, we don't want you to do that, or if you do do that, the ratings won't count, right? However, one misconception is that you could potentially appeal that and get a score changed um, from the PDGA. That, that won't happen, um, and we've talked to the PDGA a lot about this. Um, really, the, the end-all be-all in that tournament in terms of, of score, I, I, maybe there's a couple very rare exceptions to this, but I just want for all the casual golfers out there or all the competitive golfers in C, B, A tiers to know that the tournament director is going to be the final call. If they set up a course and haven't gotten a waiver, it's still going to be the final call. There may, the PDGA may do some work on the back end to sanction the, uh, the event director or to inform them that the ratings won't count or something like that, but that doesn't mean the score of the event is going to change. In this case, the waiver is in place. In this case, you know, everybody was aware of the rule. Um, it was different than OB rules. Normally you would be able to take, uh, if you're a Paul, your, your uh, lie a meter from where it last crossed OB. The, the rule on the whole was that all shots from the tee that went out of bounds had to go to the drop zone. Um, that's the way it was played, that's the way it was practiced. That was the waiver that was approved by the PDGA. Um, so I, I just worked on informing Paul that and, and talking to the uh, tournament director and the rules director conferring with them that I'd made the right call, informing the group that the score wouldn't change because, as you knew, no, it was very tight down the stretch, and the competitors wanted to know, is this the final ruling? So um, that's, that was kind of my role in that. Um, of course, in any type of that, uh, type of situation where rules come into play, all of our tournament officials on the ground try to kind of, you know, take a, a, as unobtrusive an approach as we can. We're there to, like, inform, um, make ruling if we have to, but really just get the information so that players can keep competing um, with a clear clear head. Okay, and, uh, and interesting to follow that up. And in a, I'll call it an unofficial PDGA uh, statement that I read at one point today was, uh, when you're on the ground at an event, do what the caddy book says. The middle of the round is not the time to ask for a waiver. And I thought that was, I just thought that was an interesting unofficial response and and hence I want to you know get clarification with you that's all yeah yeah no I like I think I spoke that a little bit in that you know the the caddy book and the rules for each hole are going to stand as as they're written um and in the case of you know hey this is a weird OB rule um yeah we encourage players just to to follow the the tournament as it's set up and it can be addressed on the backside. I think Paul did a great job of that. You know, I think he took a provisional, so he had an option, which is what I recommended him to do. Um, and then we kept going. Okay, and then my last one to end this and wrap this up is here we are at a, a four round event. Of course, a little bit of a precursor to the world championships yeah. and a very quick turnaround from Jonesboro. What are the conversations like year after year for how quick that turnaround is from one event to a next, uh, to the next, such as this week? Yeah, they're they're always they're always there. The conversations about um, you know how rapid events are. If there should be a week off, I know that more and more events have interest in being on the tour. Um, you know, we've cut out some events that we'd like to have on the tour. Some events cycle off, but uh, the long and the short of it is is that you know the, there's going to be 
continuing to be growth of deserving events on the Disc Golf Pro Tour at the elite level. We see that growth to continue, and players are going to end up having to make choices. And I think that it's a good competitive landscape for events. If if they want the top competition to come there to their event, they have to do things to make it special, to add to the history, the prestige, the purse, the course, make players want to come play that event, make sure that it was a great experience for everybody involved. Um, because I, I do think like if we have, you know, you know, 35 straight weeks of events, um, you know, I don't expect players to play every event. You know, I, I know that, you know, we have a system set up where right now you've got eight of 12 elite series events that count. Um, you've got the playoff events, but only two of three majors count in our, in our point system on the way to the tour championship and only, um, three of eight silver series. So there's breaks in there. Um, there's weeks off in there, but there are stretches where there's two events or three events in a row, uh, a little less than last year. I think we, we planned a little bit differently, but I, I don't see us necessarily slowing down. Um, I know that, you know, everybody wants a, a week off after, you know, a major, this is a, a new major. We, we probably will always have that week off before worlds, you know, cause there's some w events there, but, um, I think the trend is going to continue to be, there are more events on the schedule and, um, those events are going to have to do a great job of, uh, keeping a very strong field there. Um, and I think players rightfully should prioritize their bodies and, and play when, when they feel prepared to play and, and maybe schedule in breaks as necessary. Um, and the events that are most important, you're going to see incredible strong fields at and, um, other events, I think, you know, if, if some of the best in the world take a break, um, it, it gives other people a chance to shine and, and maybe break through for the first DGPT victory. All right, everyone. That is our CEO in Jeff Spring. We wish you the best of luck this week. And for everyone here on the ground, Brian Hayden and myself, uh, we appreciate you guys joining us for the press conference. And we'll see you tomorrow morning live for the action for the FPO field right here at the Dynamic Dis Open. Thanks, Sarah.